This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 473, recorded on December 22nd, 2017. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me here today in New York City, Dixon Despommier. Ho, ho, ho. <laughs> Are you Santa? Um, we'll, we'll see about that. St. Nick? <clears throat> Close. Hello, Vincent. You and I like to argue, don't we? We No, we discuss vehemently, <laughs> but we don't argue. It is six degrees Celsius and cloudy. Yeah, it's kind of a drab day. It's pretty drab. Um, it's not unpleasant. There was, I must say, no traffic this morning. Zero. Zero is here right. in one hour. That's correct. The parking lot's empty. Yep. I wish every day were like this. Oh. Everyone should just go away. <laughs> Let me just say that the other day I had some time. Don't ask me why, but I did. So I went to see the Star Wars movie. And I won't spoil anything for you except to say that I went at 3.20 in the afternoon Mm-hmm. And I went to the um, X Max, the one with the comfortable seats and the three mm-hmm. D glasses. Mm-hmm. I was one of four people. Yeah, they're going to make a lot of money on and, that. And they've already made their money, but I mean, I had this thing like I was sitting in my front room. Nice. Huh? It was fantastic. Rich, have you seen it yet? No, also, but I haven't been introduced, so I can't talk. He can't talk. Oh, you're not here yet. That's right. Also joining us from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hi. Oh, hello, doing? Rich. <laughs> I'm doing good. He just jumped into the conversation with hyperspace. Uh, I'm doing. Uh, I'm doing real, real good. So, quickly, it is uh, 68 Fahrenheit on its way to the 40s. That's uh, 20 degrees C. And uh, last I looked, I actually, I actually went outside and it was raining. Right. Um, but uh, rain's going to go away. The temperature's going to drop. Actually, at the end of the week, it's going to rain grandchildren, which is really great. <laughs> Got everybody here. Also joining us from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. And it's uh, gray, cloudy skies and just um, just starting to flurry right now, but that's supposed to switch over to wintry mix. This wintry evening. mix. Yes. <clears throat> did you fly Yuck. did you fly this week? Um this week, no, I did not. Okay. And finally from southeastern Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi everybody. Hey, Kathy. Hi, Kathy. Here, here it is 35 degrees Fahrenheit, 1 degree Celsius, and cloudy. Got snow on the ground? Uh, just the ugly dregs of the <laughs> earlier snow that we had. Right. Dregs. Dregs. Good word, dregs. You can imagine putting an accent on dregs. Dregs. <laughs> uh, so Kathy, anything left to tell us about ASV? Sure. Big news. The registration link is open, so you can go to that page and uh, check out the costs for registering. And that lets me segue into the point that, of course, it costs less if you're an ASV member. So now would be a really good time (laughs) to uh, update your membership so that you don't have to worry about doing that in January. And early in January, the housing information, the details will go up with maps of where the various locations are for the meetings meeting itself and the, and where the housing is. So check out the registration, get your membership up to date, and we'll talk to you about it again next year. A Friday. Yeah, Friday is this year, but then it'll be released next year. When is the first? Oh, you're right. I guess it'll be released on the 31st. 31st is, yeah, the uh, first is on, is on Monday. Monday, so yeah, it'll yeah. be released this year. We have one more show this year. All right, we have a follow-up from Joseph, who writes, Greetings again, Twiv Docs. As someone who worked on identifying physiologically relevant CD8-positive T-cell epitopes for potential dengue vaccines, thanks for covering the latest on Dengvaxia. The background scuttlebutt in our biotech circles probably led to skepticism about this vaccine, but now the data are are emerging. It's a bummer because an effective dengue virus vaccine for all individuals is very much needed. Following up on Scott Halstead's CD8 T-cell recommendation, 
We've hit that pretty hard over the past few years. I've included some links to publications from my former lab at Immunotope Inc. on these topics. The super quick summary is that we used immunoproteomic approaches to identify HLA-A2 and HLA-A24 restricted CD8 T-cell epitopes derived from dengue virus proteins. We've demonstrated that a number of these epitopes are conserved between the four strains and can induce cross-reactive CD8 T-cell responses, at least in humanized mouse models. But because mice lie, we find we did find CD8-positive T-cells that recognize these epitopes in dengue virus seropositive patients. I think the antibody versus T-cell argument will forever be a part of vaccine circles, but I agree with Rich, both arms of the immune response are probably necessary for full protection and vaccines that can induce protective antibody and CD8 T cell responses will be ideal. It gives a number of links to these papers. They will be in the letters section. You can find the link to that in every episode's show notes. Finally, and I just became a Patreon supporter. <coughs> Thanks for all you do for promoting virology and almost every other ology and science communication. Joe is a instructor at Villanova University. They have a terrific basketball team this year. They have had in the past many terrific ones, right? They have, but this year in, in oh, yeah? particular, yeah. Has well, he written us before? Uh, he said it's, uh, y- you know, he's back. Greetings okay. again, TwivDoc, so I presume so, yes. Sounds familiar, Joseph Comber. Yeah. Jo- Joseph from Villanova sounds familiar to me. Um, so thank you very much. We are having a, a dengue arc, <laughs> and we're continuing that today. So these will these issues will be relevant. Today we're going to talk about antibodies. Dixon, can you take Anthony's? I'll do my best. <laughs> Although that's at times not good enough, but this I think for I who, can handle this. For who isn't good enough? I, it's good enough for me, of course, but a lot of other people say that I stumble a lot when I read, and probably I do. I think so, you will do beautifully on Anthony's email. Thank what you. What a so positive much. guy. <laughs> <laughs> Alan Ritz. Hey, look at that. No, Alan writes. No, it's not Alan. <laughs> I'm just making that up. Dang. Okay, Anthony writes. In TWIV 471, there was mentioned that in some cases, the first infection with dengue is severe. It is known for certain that these really are first infections? Or is it known for certain that these are really first infections? Might it be that there was a prior infection so mild that those people did not even realize they were sick? That's an interesting question, but how would you know? Well, I think there are enough first infections that we wouldn't get it wrong in all those cases. I mean, this is... It's True. out there. The, epi- the epidemiology is out there. And they do studies where they check serologically, so you make yeah, right. sure it's a first sure, infection. Sure, sure. So you can tell, right? Well, in that case, they can answer that question. So if you came in the hospital with severe dengue, eventually you would have s- antibodies to more than one serotype, right? According to the uh, current hypothesis, yes. But that would be antibody enhanced. But there's some primary cases of dengue where you do get serious disease, which is not antibody dependent presumably because you haven't had an infection before right, right and i i don't know the data there but i would guess that there's been some serology done to show that so if hmm. anyone knows maybe joe comber knows right um i i think the the major risk factor for severe dengue is a second infection right but it does happen primarily oh this is a good point i understand but i think the data are there that said that it's not the case yeah and you could um I mean, if you if somebody shows up at the hospital with severe dengue and they only have antibodies against one type of dengue, right? That would argue against a prior infection because most of what we what we talk about with um, antibody dependent enhancement or whatever mechanism which we'll talk about today um, is is based on second infection with a different serotype. So if you've never seen any other serotype before. Maybe it's possible that you had this same serotype and then got reinfected with the same serotype, but that would still have to be a different mechanism from what we normally think of. Yeah. All right. A few items of business. First, the needle is open for business. Amazing. Very recently, yes. in the last two weeks, according to the website, the needle website, BU Lab will begin studying deadly viruses. I was only putting that at about 25% odds. 
They, Boston University's high security laboratory can begin studying Ebola, Zika, and other deadly pathogens. Well, actually, you could study Zika now. You don't need a BSL-4. Right. After the city's public health commission gave final approval last week for the work to proceed, the move ended a decade and a half of controversy. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> Built with $200 million in federal money, the building has been mostly empty since its completion in 2008. Of course, it was full while we filmed it. We were there. <laughs> Not enough, yes. but there, were, there was us walking around, and that was fun. If you go to the Needle website, that's, that video is still on the front page. So that's great news. Everyone there must be happy. Yeah. Mm. Especially those who have been traveling to other BSL-4s to get their work done. Now they can stay home. And it means nobody will ever again be able to shoot a video like ours. No. Because we, we walked all through the, the BSL-4 section and got video and all that. And wow, it was great. That was, yeah. that was really a that wonder. That was good fun. Sorry I missed it. I'm sorry you missed it. I am too. You probably thought it wouldn't be so interesting, right? No, that's not why I missed it. Why did you miss it? I had uh, something else scheduled. I, otherwise, I would have gone. Uh, you could have canceled Probably it. fishing. <laughs> and I, I wasn't here yet, but, uh, <laughs> but Paul Dupree took me through on a tour a couple years later. You weren't on TWIV yet? Nope. Wow. Right. There was a or you had, or you, I, or you had just brought me on, and you already had that scheduled. I think mm. that was the deal. Maybe yeah, we should like revisit it. <laughs> well, we could look from the outside. That's the best we can yeah. do. Unfortunately, yeah. can't get that kind of access anymore now that they're now, now they're going you know, hot. Supposedly they're going to build another four in uh, Kansas. Mm. You know, so maybe we can go see that one. You can come, mm -hmm. Kathy and Dixon can come along. Mm -hmm. Now is that yeah, that's the uh, human uh, that's pathogens, the, or is that the agricultural one? Is, yeah, I think, that's, I the think that's the agricultural one. That's the one that's going to replace Plum Island, right? Right, yeah. right. So you don't have cool. to suit up, right? To the same uh, extent? No. Well, so I, I, or I would think I you would. I did when I was in Plum Island. It was shower in, shower out, change yeah, clothes. Yeah. Shower, that's right. Shower in, shower out. Was Sydney out. Brenner in charge? Not Sydney Brenner. There was another Brenner in charge of wasn't case. Sydney. No, it wasn't Sydney, but it was somebody else like that who was in charge of that facility that I actually met. And... Uh, he had some interesting stories about Plum Island. <laughs> Best quote from Sidney Brenner: "Anything made by evolution is bound to be a bit of a mess." <laughs> I love that. Another story in the news: Many listeners have sent us this article from various places. I have a science article here: NIH lifts three-year ban on funding risky virus studies. Right. Even science couldn't cover this I mean, properly. Ridiculous. What's the risky virus? They're not meant to be risky. Exactly. Risque. You know? Maybe they meant risque viruses. Yeah, right. So there there are a number of as Alan mentioned, there's a number of outlets, and Alan will elaborate, who call this risky, trying to make deadly viruses. Gain of function. Yeah. So as so I was I was very glad to see the news that this um so for people who haven't followed the history of this a few years ago, there was um, one particular paper that set off a lot of people um, in which, um, uh, well, there were two papers, actually, um, uh, Kawaoka's group in Wisconsin and uh, Fouchier's group um, at uh, Erasmus, right? Um, mm -hmm. And they both were working on um, avian flu and, and did some experiments with it. You can go back and and Google this and, and find the information fairly easily. Uh, and we talked about those extensively on TWIV when the papers finally came out. But what, what came out of that process was um, there was this tremendous amount of hype and a, an organization that had never been convened for this purpose was suddenly drawn in and forced to do review on these papers before they were published. <clears throat> um, because the journal editors said, hey, you know, these people have passaged this flu virus and, and made it um, apparently more transmissible between ferrets. And, and now we're all worried that this could become a pandemic flu. And so the um, the NSABB, which was convened as a really a study and advisory committee, um, was brought in to review those papers and decide if they were safe to publish. And we've talked about that. Um Finally, one of the th the papers were eventually published. Uh, it turns out that, yes, they did adapt the virus to ferrets and it made it more transmissible in ferrets and simultaneously made it less pathogenic in the ferrets. Um, <laughs> which seems to so, be ignored by everyone. Which is ignored by <laughs> everybody except TWIV, that, that you had this trade-off that happened. Um, and anyway, and, and there's no there are no data, of course, on what this would do in humans, um, though... 
it's adapted to ferrets, which are not humans, so I wouldn't expect it to be particularly dangerous in humans. In any case, um, during the whole hullabaloo and hype around that, um, which was, uh, I, I just realized that was 2011. That was six years ago. <laughs> um, <clears throat> one of the things that happened was, uh, there was a, a pause in research. And this, this happened a few years later in 2014. Um, that, because uh, eventually coronavirus has got drawn into this. Right. Stuff. So coronaviruses, there were, there were subsequent studies that, um, uh, raised similar hackles for similarly weak reasons and then completely unrelated events like somebody found a couple of old vials of uh, variola smallpox um, that had not been properly secured and um, so then then in the midst of all this uh, the the US government decided to pause the funding of what they categorized as gain of function studies and these are studies that give any new capability that might scare, I don't know, some random person um, to a virus. So if you are passaging a virus, a, um, a virus that I guess is scary in the news, um, influenza, MERS, SARS, and uh, that might increase its transmissibility in some host, then that apparently is enough to... Uh, <clears throat> to fall into this pause. So a huge amount of research got covered by this and now labs, um, couldn't do anything even remotely in that direction on this whole family of viruses or not family of viruses, this whole area of viruses, which were nebulously defined, um, <clears throat> that has finally now been reversed. Uh, so the process for that, they, they, uh, NSAPB finally went back to its day job and put together some criteria for studies that should be allowed. And there was a whole um, discussion of this and uh, HHS came up with a framework for reviewing these proposals. Um, and now based on that, they are lifting this funding pause and allowing research to proceed on these. So I'm, it's good news. Alan, do you think anything we ever said on TWIV mattered no. to cause them to do this? No. <clears throat> no. Because no. we were dead against it to begin with. <laughs> no, no one listened to us, in particular the proponents, the people who are mainly against this. Mark Lipsitch, yeah. Michael Osterholm, uh, Richard E. Bright. They must be fuming right now. I don't know if they ever really understood what was being done because they really got it wrong when they talked about it. Lipsitch continued to say this is all about looking for mutations in the wild that predict transmission. That's not what it was about. And no matter how much we explained it, none of them ever picked up on that. They always yeah, had this risky business. They weren't the, the ones to reverse it, were they? No, it was reversed by the NIH. <coughs> so do you think they may have no, heard through the rumor mill? No, uh, all, all they did oh, I would feed, love to think it did. <laughs> all they did was feed the flames of this in the yeah, press and and get their own names in print as a result. And that's... And the press goes to them all the time for comments, not right, us. Because, anyway. you know, they go to them because they know what you're going to... They know what they're going to say and it's going to yeah. be inflammatory and it's going to feed <laughs> into the newsworthy of, worthiness of this, which frankly, if you know the science behind it, it's not particularly newsworthy and this never should have happened in the first place. Mm -hmm. This was an error. Um, but it <laughs> became this issue because it was so heavily hyped and because there were fear mongers saying that these are dangerous studies and unfortunately the coverage of the reversal of the of the pause has been similarly fraught with the same type of terminology it's uh, um science uh, you know they've got the headline funding risky virus studies <laughs> uh, and uh, uh that that's actually the least offensive of these stories and they they in fact managed to interview reasonable people talking about this um if you look at uh, uh other like new york times coverage bbc coverage uh, normally reasonably good outlets they did a horrible job they in many cases they only talked to people like lipsitch and osterholm um and talked about increasing the uh, the risk of these viruses spreading, and and that's what the research is doing. And of course, that's not what it's doing, and that's not even what it has accomplished, because the study that tripped all this off appears to have made a less pathogenic virus and has never escaped. And there's not been anything like that, so it's just the whole thing is quite absurd. It's been a waste of three years, not allowing yes. this work to go forward. Now, 
If you want to do this now, there are guidelines put in place by the NIH has to be approved by a special committee. And yes. Of course, the skeptics are You'll still— You'll be subjected to extreme vetting. The skeptics are still worried. You know, they quote Lipsitch saying, oh, we'll see how they do with this committee. Come on, give me a break. You don't even know what these experiments are about. Stop talking. And Jocelyn Kaiser, who wrote the science article, you know, she interviewed Tim Collins, who said these experiments that we paused, they're probably out of date now, so they'll probably have to reapply. So that's a great quote. Why not get someone who's excited to say, let's go forward and do all these cool experiments? You know, it was Francis Collins. Francis Collins. Yeah, I always get the, his name wrong. Yeah, she didn't yeah, say Phil the, Collins <laughs> or Tom Collins. <laughs> exactly. The, right. uh, the NPR study quoted Matt Freeman, and he had yes. the appropriate excitement and exuberance about it. So that was good. <laughs> yeah, and, I want to point out did best on this. I think. Yeah, I want to point out uh, on the right hand side of this science. Uh, article, the related jobs. The top one is faculty positions, yep. virology and viral pathogenesis, BSL 2, 3, and 4, Boston, Massachusetts, <laughs> there you go. Boston University. So interesting. Kind of a uh, connection of our two arcs so far. Anyway, this has been a real boondoggle. It's been a waste of time. I think these people didn't do anyone any favors. They didn't understand the work. So let's move forward. I, j- I will note that. Um, Martin, who often writes us uh, about the badness of vaccines, and so we rarely read his emails. He sent this story to us, and he wrote, be sure to thank the Donald for this, and we should point out that he had nothing to do with the reversal. Yeah. He doesn't even know it exists. He wouldn't understand it if you tried to explain it to him. He wouldn't even listen to you. No, he wouldn't. Am I being too harsh? I think no. that's totally reasonable. And mm-hmm. I, I like um, that... Martin's source uh, is <laughs> Russia For Today. The, Russia yeah. Today. <laughs> All right. So one more news story, which is a real unfortunate story. Uh, some of you may know that um, not too long ago, the Salk Institute was embroiled in a controversy. Three faculty members were suing the Institute. This is over the summer saying that Salk discriminates women, against women in salary benefits, promotion, and access to money. And the president uh, of Salk is Liz Blackburn, the Nobel laureate. And at the time, she responded qu- kind of harshly by saying the uh, allegations are untrue. And now she's stepping down as chair of the Salk, which is unfortunate. Yeah. Because uh, here it's good to have a female leader, and um, she's getting embroiled in this. Now, no one knows. It's probably fair to say that she's likely stepping down because of this issue, but no one has said that outright. Nor nor would anyone, yeah. I think. Now, Inder Verma is also uh, stepping down as, uh, what's his position at the National Academy? Uh, he's editor-in-chief of PNAS. PNAS. So he was involved with, with this. As, he was one of the people accused of discrimination, and mm-hmm. so he's stepping down from his PNAS position, but he's, he's remaining at the Salk. This is just unfortunate business that has to go on here, but yeah, that's what it is. Um, it's too bad. Okay, now we have two papers for you. Now on to the science. And right. we will, science is, you know, there's always science news. We feel we should tell you about it. Yes. Warm you up for the show, right, Dixon? Absolutely. And do we have two papers on dengue? And I promise these will be the last dengue papers for the year. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> <Yes>. Oh, wow. <laughs> Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> nice. I don't know. It could be something next week. Right? I mean, we still got one more show. Could be. And if people didn't get enough, they can also listen to the immune episode about this. We talked a little bit about this on immune mm-hmm. number three because I thought that uh, I would. Lo- I wanted to hear Stephanie and Cindy's perspective. Those are my two co-hosts on Immune Dixon. By the way, Dixon Immune is a new podcast. From is it really? Microbe TV slash wow. Immune. You know. Wow. Yeah. yeah. I actually knew I think that. they should have called it non-self. But. Non-self. That's, that was a good name. Yeah, I like non-self. I wanted Node. No. <laughs> no one liked Node. Isn't that a cool name? Because we're full of them. All right, anyway, two papers. And the reason we're doing these, first, uh, last week someone suggested uh, one of these papers, and this is a science paper. I think it was uh, Andrew at Johns Hopkins, yeah. Uh, in, before you go any further, I just had a great 
new title, which would wow. include molecular biology of immune and immune. And we <laughs> called, I have a code in my node. <laughs> okay. You're so corny. It's good. Uh, this, this paper in science called antibody dependent enhancement of severe dengue disease in humans. That was mentioned by Andrew Caraba, I believe last week. And so we, d- we decided to do this. And this, I also cut the article out and brought it in. And yes, it was, had been sitting on my table because Dixon, yes. what he does, he gets a subscription to science. He does. And periodically comes in and he's ripped out articles. Periodically? That's that's very good, Vincent. <laughs> what what does yeah. periodically mean? It's a periodical. It's a periodical. No, right, but in terms of, of uh, frequency, what would you say periodically is? It means it comes out regularly. It doesn't have any, it could be a day, two days, three days, that's as long as it's regular, right? That's correct. But here's what he does. He takes them and he puts them on my desk to, to make me think he's reading our articles. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's that's... Vincent. I'm just kidding. Be it's nice he's not it. Be it's nice year of end Dixon. jokes. And now this one I have here, and it had turned over, and on, I'm looking at this morning, and I go, atomic model for the dimeric region of mitochondrial ATP <laughs> synthase. And I go, what the hell is this for? And I turned it over. And go, oh, it's on the other side of the Zika paper. Uh, right. <laughs> so that's one paper, and that is um, by Katselnik, Gresh, Halloran, Mercado, Juan Gordon Balsameda and Eva Harris. You Balmaceda. did the inversion again. What did I do? <laughs> you said Balsameda. It's Balmaceda. So I'm obviously. You're Liz Dexic. What can getting, I say? <laughs> I'm, I'm getting out of it. Uh, Vincent, I also had marked this when I got the journal with oh, yeah. a question mark twib. Yep. And, um, but I okay. didn't send it to you. So, and, and by the way, this will correct, I think, something I think I alluded to in the last episode where we were talking about antibody-dependent en- enhancement. And I think I said that this is something that's been observed in vitro, but not in humans. I think this is and, the first time, right, in humans? And I, I had not seen, this paper just came out in November, and I hadn't seen it. Um, and yeah. uh, so this this well, is in humans. Well, we've see, we see severe disease in humans, but now we're showing we see, that it's depending right, it, on the, it. This mechanism of yeah. antibody-dependent enhancement. The paper is from Berkeley uh, and a number of sites in Nicaragua. Eva Harris has a wonderful collaboration for many years between Berkeley and sites in Nicaragua. Also, the University of Michigan. Yeah, Aubrey's here in the School of Public Health. Aubrey Gordon. Gordon. Okay, and then the other paper. And also Fred Hutchinson. Okay. We're going to do is also um, a science paper, which came out in January of this year. And the the lead author, Taya Wong, uh, sent it to me because I had met her. We actually had interviewed her for a position. Taya was also involved in the gain-of-function business. She was a postdoc with Peter Palazzi, and he and the two of them wrote a science article looking at serum level and antibody levels to mm, H5N1. Yes. So I got to know Taya, and then she got a job at Stanford, and she sent me this paper way back when. And, you know, I didn't know what to do with it. And then when I saw this other dengue paper, I had this thing, aha, let's do them both together. Yep. So this is called IgG antibodies to dengue enhanced for FC gamma R3A binding determined disease severity. We'll explain it. <laughs> the first author is Taya Wong and the authors are Siwatanon Memoli Ramert Burnazos Baumik Pinsky Chokefibulkit Onlamun Patan Payatsa, Daubenberger, Ahmed, Mafia Ahmed, and Jeff Ravitch. That's good, good for you. you. you Holy cow. I was wondering Vincent. if you were going to do that. <laughs> Did I uh, amazing. invert any of them? I don't no know. No, I you know. never know. Okay, okay, you get a lot of write-ins yeah. on this one, I think. All right, so this, and <laughs> yes. from the Rockefeller, Stanford, Emory, Mahidol University in Bangkok, and the NIAID of NIH. Yeah. Now, here's the challenge here. These papers say two different things. And they say things slightly different from the CD8 T cell. All right. So in the end, what we're going to find is that probably a lot of things are involved in this severe yeah. dengue disease. It's complicated. <laughs> it's complicated. Yes. It's evolution. Now, the first, the first one, <laughs> antibody-dependent enhancement of severe dengue disease in humans. This is the result of quite a large trial in kids in Nicaragua, which was carried out between 2004 and 2016. 8,000 children between 2 and 14 years of age. For 12 years. 12 years. 41,302 serum samples were taken and examined. That's a lot of work. 
And so if you look at the authors on this who are from Nicaragua, I think they probably deserve a lot of the credit for all those serum samples. That's right. They have a cohort of kids who they follow for many years for dengue. You know, they check them uh, frequently. And the idea here is to say, okay, we know that there's this theory that antibodies are making severe dengue, you know, dengue hemorrhagic fever, dengue shock syndrome, the, the severe dengue, which makes you get hospitalized. But what about the antibodies? Is it a specific feature of them. And here they're saying there's a, there's an idea that a, a specific concentration of antibodies is involved. So let's look at that. You want to say, is there, is there a correlation between severe disease and how much antibody against the virus that you have? And, and that was not a random idea. This is the in vitro data suggests that there may be a concentration level right. of antibody that, right. that exacerbates antibody dependent enhancement. And if you're within that window of concentrations, then you get better antibody dependent enhancement. If you're below it or above it, then you don't. So, for, so for to, to, and to me, this makes intuitive sense. If you don't have, yes. if there's not enough of the antibody to one serotype, then there's not you know, enough there to cause a problem. And if there's a super abundance, then, uh, you've really got, uh, uh, that'll confer immunity. Right. It's not, it's not just gonna... hear this group uh, machinating around the table as to how in the hell are we going to answer that question? Yep. You know, what kind of work do we have to do to prove this, to get data on this? And mm -hmm. now you know the answer. How many kids again? 8,000 kids. 41,000 serum, 41, serum samples. 41,000 serum samples. That's how long it took to find out the answer to that very simple question. It's actually a subset of these kids because there's 6,684 who uh, yeah. gave serum. Right. Yeah, they had at least one antibody titer measurement. All right, so then the assay they use is, is a little different. So let's talk about that. It's called an I-ELISA. An I-ELISA. So basically, they're looking for antibodies that bind viral proteins, but it, it's done a little bit different differently. <clears throat> so they take the serum from these kids, they make dilutions, and then they ask if they can compete with an, a viral-specific antibody, which is labeled so they can track it, binding to a mixture of antigens from all four serotypes. So we have a known antibody, which is binding dengue ant antigens, and then they add the serum in and ask, can it compete away the binding? Yeah, so the I, I guess, stands for inhibitory yeah. or inhibition. And Based on avidity. Affinity. Avidity. 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 Why? Well, the more avid the antibody, the more binding concept. Well, this is IgG. The okay. There's only one binding, so. Well, but it does have a... Okay, uh, but um, affinity, and if, if you had... IgM, then invidity would be the sum of the affinities, right? Okay, yeah. Because you have multiple. Yeah, that, no, that's absolutely right. Now, so this, they say, that this, an, this assay measures antibodies that bind to cross-reactive epitopes, mm -hmm. okay? And these are the ones that induce antibody-dependent enhancement in, in vitro and in mouse models as well. Okay, so these kids were followed. They, If they got sick, they would diagnose them with dengue or not. Of course, if they went in the hospital, with severe dengue, they would know that as well. So then they could make a correlation between serum antibody levels and what kind of dengue they had, right? right? And, and the so, serum antibody levels are given as a dilution. Right. Yes. Like one so to, a, one to and the, the higher the second number, the more dilute the antibody. So the, the um, that represents a, a higher concentration of, of antibody titer. Or avidity. It was, yeah. <laughs> right. A more That's potent right. antibody exactly. response. Exactly. So they use statistical procedures in, in, in involving hazards calculations. They make graphs of the hazard of having severe dengue if you have a certain concentration of antibody uh, in your serum. And so you have these graphs, uh, which, are, which populate the paper of serum dilutions versus your hazard ratio, the hazard of having a more severe disease. And so they can compare all these uh, groups of individuals, and they... They adjust them for sex, epidemic season, age, number of previous infections, which is all important stuff. And so what they find is the hazard for getting severe disease was similar in children with no antibody or with high antibody over 1 to 1,280. In children with levels of 1 to 20 to 1 to 80, intermediate level, the hazard was 7.6-fold higher. 
Okay. Right. So you have this intermediate level of antibody to dengue. That's where you're more likely. More likely, not absolute, right? It's sevenfold. That's where you're more likely to have severe dengue. It was easy to see this data, too, because you just took a pen yeah. and you circled the highest peak you, with the here, here my titer. Here's the paper. And there it went. It's <laughs> out on my desk right now. But I did that, and I took my pen, and I just circled each. Every one of them fell right on the, right on the money. So during the 12 years of this study, a child with pre-existing antibody titers of 1 to 20 to 1 to 80 had a hazard of 11% for serious dengue, which is twice as high for a child with a prior infection, but with low titers, like less than 1 to 20 mm-hmm. or so. I, I kind of think of it as the opposite of the Goldilocks effect. Yes. So it's right. It's, yes. it's, no, that's it's, right. Exactly. Yeah, it's right. not too little and it's not too much. It's just wrong. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> that's a good title. <laughs> now, what I find really a little scary here is in this study, they could also figure out the half life of dengue antibody. Yes. Right? Yeah, this really interested me. Four years is the half life. So that means if you start out, you get infected and you have a high titer of antibody, which will protect you from serious disease over time, you're going to go into that 1 to 20, 1 to 80 zone, so you're going to become at risk. That's pretty scary, isn't it? And they found yep. by three three years post-infection, 22% of the kids had antibody dengue antibody titers in that 1 to 20 to 1 to 80 range. Yep. Mm. So it's yeah. it's kind of, it's a timing issue and also an initial immune response level issue. Uh, different people are going to have their antibodies decay at different rates. But if this is going on, you know, on average, uh, this is not good news. No, not at no, all. You're, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you do. It also suggests, going <laughs> back right. to, the Deng, to the Dengvaxia story, that in a few years we may be having another conversation about Dengvaxia. Right. Yeah, right. that's right. Because exactly right. The, the recommendation they're making is that you should only get this vaccine if you've had previous exposure to dengue. Mm-hmm. Well, what about if you had previous exposure to dengue, dengue several years ago and your antibodies have now decayed, you know, below a particular level? This is, I don't know. Right. Nature's conundrum. Uh, they, they take the same data and it turns out that... In, uh, In 2009, WHO revised the classification guidelines for severe dengue. Basically, they broadened them to make it easier to to take care of patients. So they reinterpreted their data in light of that. And again, this 1 to 20 to 1 to 80 still turns out to have the highest hazard ratio. But the protective effect now is at 1 to 320 and higher rather than 1 to 1,280 and higher. Okay, So that's just a minor thing. So that's really it. And and one thing that I think is really interesting that they point out, so the correlate of risk for severe dengue is different from the correlate of protection. So last time, Alan introduced this idea of cor- correlate of protection. And for many viruses, we don't know what it is, antibody, cell, mediated immunity. But here, for one infection, you have two distinct disease entities, and the correlates are different. So that has never been you know, considered in, in vaccine manufacture, as they point out. The vaccine manufacturers only have to ind- show that you can induce neutralizing antibodies, not a certain level, right? Right. So that is a problem. That is that is usually something in a in a phase one or two trial of a vaccine, you would be checking the antibody titer that you get, and you would hope that, be- that higher is better. But usually if you're getting antibodies at any reasonable titer, you'd say, okay, we're done. We've got a good vaccine. Uh, but here, now, it suggests you, you really need to be above this window. And I remember that the type 2 component of the Deng vaccine did not induce such high neutralizing antibodies. I wonder if that is is in this range of you know, correlating with uh, severe dengue disease. Mm, yeah. Um, now, they, they end up by saying, you know, this is just antibodies, but we're sure that cellular immunity, innate immunity, they're all going to be involved in this severe disease. This is just one picture, right? So right. from this, is the, the bottom line here is that there's a certain concentration of antibodies. When you get infected, you can make very little. You can make an intermediate level or high. Now, the intermediate levels correlate with having severe dengue. And this, cor- this fits nicely with the laboratory data, yep. which show Correct. the same thing, that same there's thing. an intermediate level that gives you antibody-dependent sure. enhancement. So sure. this is a... Sure. 
a pretty strong indication that the molecular mechanism that's been proposed from laboratory studies is, in fact, at least part of what's going on in humans. Right. So when you see something this regular and this predictable from this very large person study, I mean, the N is very large on this, mm. then it makes you wonder if there's any selective advantage for the virus to have this kind of a pattern. You mean in terms of... Uh, Transmission or something? Well, so when people are infected or presented with an antigen, you always, in a population, you'll always have a range of responses, right? Sure. So I don't think this is any different from does, normal. But does human illness correlate with anything to do with a an advantage for the spread of this virus? That's my question. So severe dengue, right? I'm not sure you... I'm not sure that's a good transmission thing uh, modality because you're in a hospital, right? Well, well before you really. were in, before <laughs> hospitals existed, yeah, right. You would exactly. have been exactly. These would have been the pressures had to happen. Yeah, there, there is there is this general this general theory that for a vector borne disease, it can be adaptive to incapacitate the host. Why is right. that? Because they can't because they can't swat the mosquitoes. mosquitoes, and then yeah. Right, but also if, um, if viremia is higher, that could help, right? Vi a high, vi high viremia is going to be probably the most helpful thing for dengue. It could sure. so it could, yep. so you know, replicate. So what these antibodies do? They allow the virus to replicate in cells where it doesn't normally by getting in via FC receptors, right? So they right. you do get more virus produced. So that could be part of it, Dixon. So there is an evolutionary correlate here. Maybe. Well, there's that's your theory, that's your hypothesis. This is right? exactly right. So now, what's the observational? <laughs> and it, it is certainly <laughs> results you've got it already. Is, <laughs> it is certainly um, selected for the virus to um, to avoid generating long lasting, really good immunity. Yes. Right. So if a, if right. serotype two of dengue was completely knocked out by serotype one. Uh, infection history, then serotype two would never get going. Mm -hmm. um, so it it is advantageous to these viruses to um, to be able to avoid the antibodies that were raised against a different one, and to be able to avoid raising antibodies that are going to provide long lasting, robust immunity. So this this whole graph kind of fits with a virus that has evolved a a sensible strategy to survive in a population in the presence of ongoing immunity. Right. So it may just be a byproduct of that, that we get these cases of severe dengue. Um, that just, you know, might be our body's reaction to the way this is playing out. So let's just say that during an epidemic, um, this is never going to be a naive population ever. Right. Right. Cause there, this is an endemic infection for them, but maybe in some years there'll be a large transmission of virus of a type that induces a very high antibody response. Then four years later, now you've got a lot of people that are susceptible to the um, illness effects of dengue. Now at that point, you could then start to track to see if many more people got infected than normal during a typical outbreak of dengue as a result of this phenomenon. You could, Maybe. you could test that mm -hmm. hypothesis, mm -hmm. at least by observation. If, if you can find that population and if they're being monitored as yeah, well yeah, yeah, as yeah. this population yeah, was. Yeah, exactly. Or, or use this population, you know, take yeah, the ones yeah. that are at the high end and see what happens to them over the course of the next three or four years. You know, there's, there must also be a host component here. It has right? to be. Has which to is be. part of the response. And I just wonder if if severe dengue can can be fatal – that should be selected against in the pop. That allele should be, or those alleles should be selected against, but maybe you can't because they're essential for something else. So it's complicated. We need to do some population genetics here. As yeah, well. the death rate from this is pretty low, though. From severe dengue, even? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, it is. It's not like malaria in children. It's not the same. Okay. Yes. Go ahead. It's interesting. I mean, kind of getting back to Dixon's original question, you know, for this virus, this is how this is working. But but there are lots of viruses, like you could think of all the rhinovirus serotypes or three types of polio or whatever, where they there are these different types and yet there isn't this added mechanism right. you know, that we talk about are, are talking about is this conferring some advantage to the virus or not, that they get along without it, or all yeah, the yeah. more than fifty adenovirus serotypes or things like that. So um as it far as we know, you, right? Yeah. As far as right. we know. It, it may just be that in those cases, the virus was 
not constrained as tightly as dengue in terms of its capsid structure, and so it was able to evolve capsids in the different serotypes that are different enough that you don't get any cross-reaction with prior antibodies. All right. All right. The, um, uh, Vincent, you uh, uh, linked to a commentary in science by Mark Feinberg and Rafi Ahmed about this paper that I thought was really good. People yes. who... Uh, people who are interested in the quick overview of this, of course, it's behind a paywall as it's well. All, right? all three of the papers we're discussing today are behind, well, all, all two of the papers and this uh, overview really? are behind a paywall. Because it's, it says the work is licensed under Creative Commons, which and made somebody's me getting ripped off. <laughs> the, <laughs> which one, yeah. the commentary? The, no, the, the primary science article. Hmm. Yeah, I, I, rate in that, that long uh, one-column acknowledgement section. I had At any rate, the commentary is very good, and and one of the things that it points out is that uh, it uh, um, outlines a whole lot of questions that remain to be answered. Okay, mm -hmm. I mean, this particular study doesn't tell you what serotype the uh, kids mm -hmm. had to start with, and right. all kinds of detail like that. And whether so, then the second paper. Now, think of this as we talk about it in terms of how it would fit in with the results of the first paper. Yes. Because this is now... Or not. Or not. This is about these FC receptors, which the antibodies will bind to FC receptors, um, and that if those antibodies are bound to, to dengue viruses, that's how the virus will get into cells that it normally doesn't infect. And uh, our cells have lots of different kinds of FC receptors. Um, there are FC gamma receptors, there are alpha, there are epsilon, and the ones that are involved in phagocytosis and uptake of pathogens are the gamma. And there are several kinds, FCR, gamma R1, <laughs> R2A, R2B, 3A, 3B. Hence the title of this paper, which looks at one FC gamma R3A, just one kind of gamma FC receptor. And it's known that modification of the FC portion of the antibody can affect the... Um, binding to the FC receptor. Okay. Before we get too deeply into this, I just wanted to back up yep. very quickly. <clears throat> um, I signed in to get a copy of this paper. I just discovered that the first one we talked about, the Gatzelnik et al., is open access. Good. 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 Very good. So, correcting that. So, modifying, so the uh, antibody, the part of the antibody that binds the FC receptor is called the FC portion. <laughs> FC <laughs> right? portion, yes. It's so... <laughs> If it, go ahead, go ahead. I was just going to bring back the analogy that was on immune, where if you're standing with your feet together and your arms spread out like a Y, cool. the FC receptor yep. is the, your feet. Feet. Your feet. My two arms. I mean, the, or the FC portion, sorry, of the antibody is, is your feet, your yeah. feet and that yeah. binds to the receptor. If I had some pain, I could prove that. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So the feet, the feet portion, the FC portion, and the sugars put on that can affect the affinity of its binding to the FC receptor. Yep. And that's what they look at in this paper. They say, do people who get serious dengue have any differences in the uh, the sugars that are attached? In particular, it's a fucose, it's a core fucose. The absence of a core fucose on the FC of the antibody will cause increased affinity for FC receptor, this particular yes. one that they're looking at here. So it's, it's a little confusing because they're constantly referring to a fucosylated IgG. A fucosylated, yes. So and and, and I Without said, wait. Fucosylate. So the fucosylate, no, the A fucosylated, right. the one that's not fucosylated IgG. The review article just calls it, I think, non-fucosylated. They yeah. get around it. <laughs> Unsweet <laughs> Unsweetened. Unsweetened. Fucosylate <laughs> let's. <laughs> that doesn't work out. Dixon, Dixon, do you know what a fucose is? I do. Uh, what is it? It's a it's a sugar. It's a sugar. Is it just? It's a uh, pentose, I think. But it's a monomer, right? Yeah. So they have uh, patients who um, were hospitalized and shown to have dengue, and they got IgG antibodies from them. And they looked at the fucosylation of those. They purify the antibodies. They do mass spectrometry, and they say uh, what kinds of sugars are on them. And they can tell whether it's a fucosylated or fucosylated. So they looked at the antibodies and they said, hey, what the fucose? Oh. Mm. <laughs> right? And what they, and as a control, they have, they're looking at um, antibodies to uh, influenza hemagglutinin for, uh, for people that have been involved in a infection trial. 
They call it a controlled infection study. Um, and what they find is that in patients with severe dengue, they have an elevation of afucosylated uh, forms of the IgGs. And these so are they specific. Have more unsweetened IgGs. More unsweetened. <laughs> these are specific for the dengue virus envelope protein c- compared with patients who are infected with influenza virus. They have normal amounts of fucose. IgG light. IgG light. Yes, that's good. <laughs> okay. Um, what else here is interesting? You know, when you scroll through these papers, the figures are so big. It takes a while to get to the next one. Um, Whereas if you're reading in paper, you just flip the page. You flip the page, you make noise that I have to cut out later, yeah. It's either way, you know, it's it's, it's, it's something. Um, the other thing they find is that uh, these elevated afucosylated antibodies um, also correlate with low platelet counts for the patients. Low platelet counts, which is part of the dengue shock uh, syndrome thing, right? Low platelets. The, right. Yeah, so platelets, platelet, yeah. yeah, platelets are responsible for uh, uh, blood clotting. Right. And one of the symptoms of dengue, uh, dengue hemorrhagic fever uh, is the leakage yeah. out of your vessels. That's right. So a low platelet count makes you leak. Would make sense. Yeah. Makes you leak. So they actually take these uh, IgGs with the afucosylate, they put them in mice, and they show that it causes them to have uh, lower platelet counts. These are mice that have uh, the uh, engineered into them mm-hmm. the human FC receptor. On right. Their, uh, Otherwise, it wouldn't work, right? You would right. get the mouse FC receptor. So they re- these antibodies, the afucosylated antibodies from the patients, will reduce platelet numbers in these mice. And if they take off, um, um, yeah, and so mice lacking all the FC receptors don't have this issue when they put these antibodies in, showing that it's a direct effect of the antibody binding to the FC receptor, reduced platelet. So that's kind of a side thing here, aside from the main view, which is that the afucosylation is, is seems to correlate with severe disease. And they show the antibodies will bind to the to the platelets. And that's probably how they do that. Now, the last thing they do, which I think is really cool, they say, does this change in fucosylation happen during infection? Or it is, is it always there? These patients always have a fucosylate. And it turns out that infection triggers an elevation in IgG with enhanced affinity for the FC receptor. So for early in infection, you have normally fucosylated IgG against dengue, and then later in infection becomes afucosylated. So somehow, and that infection, gives it higher affinity for FC, and that presumably is causing or part of the enhanced disease, right? Right. And those people have lower platelets. Yeah, they also have lower platelets as a consequence of these <laughs> antibodies. Yeah. Yeah. So um, that's really interesting to think of. Why, why is that happening? And this is for dengue, right? It's not happening in these patients in, infected with influenza virus. So what is hmm. happening in infection that it would bias the production of antibodies in this way? That could be, I guess, interfering with glycosylation, right, in some way. But that would impa- that would imply infection of B cells. So I don't know what, what's going on there. It's really interesting. But now here we are. We have two papers. One paper says an intermediate concentration of antibodies correlates with severe dengue in people. Now here in people also, the antibody, they didn't look at the titers, but the antibodies have higher affinity for FC receptors. So, I, I don't think these contradict each other. No, they, they don't. No. They, they both be the same thing. So is it okay. possible, for example, that if they didn't measure titers here, but could these patients also have this intermediate titer of antibodies plus the sure. higher affinity, and that, could. that would do it, right? Sure. And in the first paper, uh, uh, not everybody with an intermediate titer uh, gets severe uh, dengue. Right. right. And it could be right. that those that do are afucosylated. And some with um, with a, a high or a low titer do get severe dengue, and it could be that those have this problem. So there could be mm-hmm. multiple mechanisms. Right. 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 And the second paper, which really was published first, does point out the possibility of a host determinants of susceptibility because there's some individuals that produce these IgGs with higher affinity for the FC yeah. receptor. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
But of course, yes, that's really an interesting thing. So you have to do some population genetics here and see if you can pinpoint something. But it's also that the infection is triggering the the production of these uh, IgGs with enhanced infinity. That's really interesting. So that's, that's Does every really strain weird. of monkey yeah. do this? That's a good question. I, I, we don't know. They didn't say. They didn't say. Um, I don't know if they even told us what serotypes were involved here. That's a good question. But uh, that would be very interesting to know. Extremely. A lot of interesting questions. Dengue's really interesting, isn't it? Yeah. That's why Scott Halstead remained attached to it for all of his adult life. And, I, and it's the most common mosquito-borne disease among yeah. humans. That's right. And really, 50% really of complicated. The, 50% of the population is now in a dengue zone. Exactly. In the world. And the mosquito is easy to control if you just control the environment. As opposed That's to malaria. The hard part. Yeah. Well, it seemed to have worked for the Panama Canal. <laughs> yeah, and it worked for it works well for relatively developed countries. Yeah, that's right. Where everybody lives in air conditioning. You're right. It may be <laughs> that in the end, before we have an effective vaccine, it will be mosquito control that does the exactly. trick. Exactly. Yes. Whether it be by control, as you're talking about, or Wolbachia-mediated yeah. control or something. Yeah, something that's like right. That's thing. right. Public health will win the day eventually. Well, I mean, window window screens are second only to flush toilets as the greatest medical advances ever. That's right true. Then. That's true. Window screens do make a difference, don't there they? There you go. Because, I mean, when you look at the um, the control that came about after the introduction of West Nile virus in this country, just standing bodies of water, temporary standing bodies mm, of water, mm. right? Not not tree hole types, but, you know, just dripping faucets and bird baths and that stuff. When they clean that stuff up, they had outbreaks in other places, but they didn't have outbreaks where they actually were so afraid of yeah. an, a return that they, they got their act together. So I, I think that, yeah, yeah. You, can, you can do a lot with just a little if you know what to do. Of course, if you just worked 80 hours a week and you were <laughs> right. inside most right. of the time, you'll get infected, right? You got it. You got it. That's, that's, All right. that's the solution. Anything else before we move on? Does anyone have any thoughts or puzzlements or anything else? I have no thoughts. You have no thoughts? <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, Dixon, would you mind taking that first email? You know, if you email? ask me to do this, I, I will I'll do it, but I can't promise I'll get it all right. You always say that. I can't promise I'll do my best. I, I, I do say that, actually. So Mark writes, <laughs> Dear Vincent and supporting Twivers, I have written for Twiv the below poem inspired by the classic The Night Before Christmas. Happy holidays, Mark. <clears throat> so here goes. Twas the night before tenure review. And all through the city, not a creature was stirring, not even Vinny. Newspapers were hung by the chimney with care and hopes science, cell, or nature would soon pick theirs. The postdoctorals were nestled all snug in their bed, while visions of funding danced in their heads. Ma in her kerchief and I in my cap had settled our brains for a long winter's nap. When out in the lab there arose such a clatter, I sprang from my bed to see what was the matter. Away to the needle, I flew like a flash, tore open vacuum locks and threw on my mask. The moon on the breast of the new-fallen snow gave a black assay's luster to objects below. When what to my wondering eyes should appear but a miniature sleigh pulled by eight viridi, with an old Hmm. <clears throat> Maybe you should read the rest. When an old driver, so lively and quick, I knew in a moment it must be St. Dick. More rapid than a trout jumps, his followers they came, and he whistled and shouted and called all by names. Now Picorna, now Toga, now Arena, now Flavi, on Bunya, on Corona, on Astro and Rio, to the top of the sequencer the, and the great polio wall. Oh, the great polio. Mutate, mutate, mutate away all. As lab techs and postdocs before tenured faculty fly, if they meet with an obstacle, they just want to cry. So to the bench top, the corsairs, together they flew with sleigh full of phages and St. Dixon, too. And then, <clears throat> in a twinkling, I heard on the roof the prancing and pawing of each little hoof. As I drew my head in, 
and was turning around. Down the chimney, St. Dick, he came with a bound. He was dressed all in fur from his head to his foot, and his clothes were all tarnished with dye stains and soot. A bundle of Dick's books were strung on his back, and he looked like a peddler, opening his pack, his eyes, how they twinkled, his dimples, how merry, his cheeks were like roses, his nose like a cherry. His droll little mouth was drawn up like a bow, and the beard of his chin was as white as the snow. The stump of a pipette he held tight in his teeth, and mist encircled his head like a viral capsid wreath. He had a broad face and a little round belly that shook when he laughed like a bowl full of jelly. He was chubby and plump, a right jolly old elf, and I laughed when I saw him in spite of myself. A wink in his eye and a twist of his head soon gave me to know I had nothing to dread. He spoke not a word, but went straight to his work and filled all the stockings with his sixth edition book and laid his finger aside of his nose and giving a nod, up the chimney he rose. He sprung to his sleigh with his team, gave a whistle, and away they all flew, like the down of a thistle. But I heard him exclaim, ere he drove out of sight, Happy Christmas to all, and to all a good night. You actually do look like St. Nick. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Very Excellent. nicely done. Very nicely, nicely done. done, and a great... Great contribution. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> yes. Fantastic. Alan, so now we have, don't be naughty to Dixon. Exactly. <laughs> you never, better not. I'm never naughty. Never, never, never. You'll get a bag of empty yeah. plaque essay. Uh, <laughs> Plenty of those. Alan, can you take the next one? Sure. Sean writes, good morning from sunny Southern California, Twisters. Uh, I'd like to offer some perspective as a newly minted PhD and postdoc to the discussion in your Just a Passing Phage podcast about work-life balance in the sciences. <laughs> To the listeners afraid of pursuing grad school because of the long hours, I want you all to know that it is possible to strike a healthy balance between work and your personal life as a grad student. In fact, it's paramount for survival. I certainly spent more than 60 hours a week working when it came to bench work, presenting da data at lab meetings, teaching reproductive health classes for LGBTQ students in the dorms, and my TA ships even more hours while grading. Grad school certainly isn't for wimps. However, I did have plenty of time for extracurricular activities, such as line dancing, getting involved with the Public Health Student Association, and attending my fraternity's events on campus. Special shout out to Delta Lambda Phi. To manage my time, I used Google Calendar to its limits, as well as other smartphone apps, e.g. Asana, to maintain my schedule and project deadlines with my advisor. And he provides a link to Asana. Um, time management is one of many skills I had to learn in order to, make, to maintain a healthy balance and stay sane. To summarize, it's possible to be a social butterfly and a scientist as long as you're organized and love what you're studying. Public health microbiology is certainly a lifelong love affair for me. Certainly, Currently, it's 62 degrees Fahrenheit and sunny in Los Angeles with 12% humidity and one mile per hour winds. The leaves are finally turning color and it feels like fall after what was a seemingly endless summer. Keep up the good work and wonderful podcast, Sean. P.S. I'm unsure if the book contest is still going, but if it is, I'd like to throw my hat in the ring. <laughs> and it, I guess maybe this letter was written before that area was on fire, yeah, or right. maybe his his area wasn't affected as much. <clears throat> Sean, hope you're still hope you're still okay. I think you missed the book. Exactly. Um, but uh, some good pointers in there. Yep. Thanks. We mm. appreciate some other perspectives. Kathy, mm. can you take the next? Hey Sure. From Teo. Dear TWIV team, I'm writing you today to thank you for all that you do for myself and others. I'm currently a senior at California Polytechnic State University, also known as Cal Poly, where I am a double major in microbiology and cell and molecular biology. I'm headed into my last quarter and I'm currently applying for various graduate programs. I wanted to thank you for giving me so much to think about as I navigate the application processes and consider my options in industry. I am not a traditional student and only began attending college at the age of 25. You all have helped to expose me to possibilities that I may not have otherwise heard about, such as clinical microbiology technician. Your frank discussions on the current academic atmosphere of graduate school has allowed me to put my options into a more realistic light. And most importantly, you have helped to keep me engaged and excited about the pursuit of discovery through experimentation. 
I've become more and more interested in virology and immunology as my educational career has advanced. I added microbiology as a second major for the pure fact that I wanted to be able to take virology, immunology, medical microbiology, and others. Currently, I work as a lab assistant in a local biotechnology company where we use corn as an expression system for producing conjugate proteins protein vaccines. I cannot tell you how lucky I feel to be studying and working on things that I know are making a positive impact on the people in the world around me. More than just a few years ago, I had no prospects past working in restaurants my whole life. Although I enjoy food and cooking, I wanted to be able to make a larger impact on people's lives. I want to encourage anyone else who took time off after high school to pursue what they are passionate for, and to never tell yourself that it is too late or you are too old. If you can make memories, you can learn. <laughs> Although I am writing in hopes of winning the book, it was way past time for a thank you from me to you. Thanks again for your immense contribution to society and science. Teo. I think that's, that's wonderful. That sounds corny. Uh, oh, come on. Because, oh, <laughs> because of his yes. research in okay. corn. Uh, or monocotyledon yeah. is corny. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Tao. That's good. Now, Bill sent a uh, link to what he calls the grad debacle looming, which, of course, is the uh, taxation of graduate student tuition. But now that the didn't happen, yeah, the tax bill has been passed, and it was not part of it, right? That's correct. Yeah. So, graduate student tuition will not be considered taxable income, right? However, and probably due to a large. A writing. number of people writing and calling, yeah. mostly calling, evidently, is what's effective. That certainly didn't hurt. Yeah. However, the bill still sucks. Oh, right. yes. It's a oh, horrible we, bill. And we're all going to find that out. It's a horrible bill, and I don't understand <laughs> totally. how, in good conscience, it could be passed. That was well, an interesting because qualifier. You were trying to, because you were trying to understand it as being in good conscience, That's which it is right. not. It's not. It's right. a, it's this is, this is very, very easy to understand. Right. As, as easy to understand as it is horrifying. This is called looting. Greed grab. <clears throat> That's yeah. it. Just remember, it, is a, it was a completely partisan vote. Yes. Right? Along party right. lines. But there can't be and, all rich Republicans. Well, there, <laughs> there can't we, we be. Know oh, no. Not, no. So no, that, that but, means a lot of people got gored by this that voted. Yes, this but they don't realize it yet. I know that, but they will. That's the, that's the key. They will. <clears throat> Rich, can you take the next Samir. one? Samir. Samir writes. Is that how I pronounce that? Yes. Mm -hmm. Samir writes, hello again. Although I risk developing a reputation as an animal trivia fact checker, <laughs> I'd like to touch on three points for listeners that might not be familiar with animal research. First, there is a back and forth about rats being, quote, bigger mice, unquote, in this episode. This is simply not true. The rat and mouse lineages diverged 12 to 24 million years ago, about the same time the common ancestor of all apes diverged from the rest of old world monkeys. Gives a link to back that up. Uh, and, and that is at the short end of the range. Physiological differences between mice and rats may make one or the other better models of human infections, metabolic, traumatic, and other, or other types of disease. These are things to keep in mind when developing any uh, animal model. Kudos to Amy for considering the Zika studies in the 40s and 50s that didn't reveal virus in any wild rats when designing her experiments. Second, a small correction on rodent comparative anatomy. <laughs> Amy incorrectly states that rats do have gallbladders and mice do not, but it's the reverse. Mice have gallbladders, rats do not. Third, a comment on laboratory rodent pricing. <laughs> Amy is not kidding when she means that laboratory bred rats and mice are expensive. In an effort to standardize animal models and limit variability between animals used in experiments, at least from a single vendor, much effort and many resources have been put into keeping laboratory rodents free from specific pathogens, genetically standardized, provided complete and standard nutrition, all while in a narrow range of ambient environmental conditions. All of these things combined increase the price of animals above what you would see for uh, fancy mice at pet stores. <laughs> Although it is true that when comparing a standard outbred stock 
of mouse and a standard outbred stock of rat, the rat is more expensive. They take more resources because they're 10 times bigger. Very specialized, genetically modified, hard to breed mice may far exceed the cost of some rats. Some large rodent vendors even put their pricing on their websites and listeners uh, can see for themselves. Best, Samir. All right. Thank you. Good. He's a veterinarian. Veterinarian. All right, the next one is from Peter, who writes, Greetings to WIV team. Currently on the Mediterranean coast of Turkey, we're halfway through September. It is still hot and dry, 33C, 54% humidity. Halfway through September. Are we a little behind here? Yeah, always. Well, <laughs> always, but uh, you know, the book contest kind of threw us back a bit. But we are resilient, if anything. With the flu season approaching, I was wondering about how the new batches of seasonal flu vaccine are tested. Obviously, lengthy pr- approval trials would not be a viable option for the annual seasonal influenza vaccines. I presume that the new batch is treated as an update of existing influenza vaccines made using established manufacturing protocols. Are any new clinical trials required, or are the new seasonal vaccines on the manufacturer's existing license? Okay, so this has had some history here. So originally I had said... So we have a 413, listen to Stacey Schultz Cherry, uh, but Kathy pointed out that she didn't address all the specific questions. And then in the meanwhile, she was featured, uh, Stacey was featured on Meet the Microbiologist podcast, number 70. Because that's uh, and, what happens when you've been on TWIV. And, <laughs> exactly. You make the rounds. And then uh, Kathy wrote to Stacy, and Stacy wrote, great question with a complicated answer. Every new lot of influenza vaccine must be tested for potency and safety, even if the viral strain components haven't changed. This is typically performed by the government regulatory agencies in the U.S. That would be the FDA. If there has been a change in the viral strain, the regulatory agencies or even the vaccine manufacturers could request a small endpoint study to show efficacy. Obviously, clinical data would be needed if a group is applying for licensure of a new seasonal inactivated influenza vaccine. A few good references include, and she gives a few links, and and another one is a great overview of the strain selection process, vaccine production, and regulatory approval timeline. And Kathy writes, the timeline is for the Southern Hemisphere. So the, for the Northern Hemisphere, just add six months to any month in the timeline. Thank you very much, Kathy. You're welcome. Thanks, Stacey. Yes. And uh, thanks to Peter for a good question. All right. Should we do a few more? Yeah, sure, sure. All right, Dixon. Can you, today. Can you John think? writes, hi. That's just a hi. <laughs> My name is John, and I'm a third-year microbiology student at the University of Glasgow. Just wanted to say that your podcasts make my every day more interesting. The first episode I listened to on TWIV had a former student from the University of Glasgow, which caught my attention, and now I'm hooked. Keep up the good work. Cheers. Makes every day more interesting, isn't every it? Every day more Great. interesting. Nice. Thank you. John, um, Alan, can you take the next one? Um, I could take the next two. Since sure. The next one is a kind of a one-liner. Anthony writes, GGO in Dutch equals GMO in English. Dr. Kirk Condit is correct. Neat. And links to a, a page. Now back to the regularly scheduled dishwashing. <laughs> <laughs> and Welkin writes, um, Hi, Vincent et al. I'm dragging behind in my TWIV listening, but after Vincent's b- visit to Boston in August, I skipped ahead to TWIV 455, Pigs in Jeans. The paper is indeed a marvel with the simultaneous knockout of a couple dozen functional herbs in a single nuclei and production of perv-free pigs. Since it wasn't discussed on the show, I wanted to point out that the perv loci are still transcriptionally active. The pervs are only rendered non-functional with respect to production of infectious virus due to mutations in the viral pol gene. This has implications for recombination. You don't have to go any further than the archives of the Goff Lab to find an example of a Paul defective retrovirus being rescued by viral recombination, most likely by co-packaging of RNA genomes and recombination during reverse transcription. This happens because retroviruses package two copies of the viral RNA at one virion and because re, uh, reverse transcriptase can jump back, <clears throat> back and forth between the two RNAs to produce a recombinant provirus. Retroviruses are also known to package heterologous RNAs, which is likely how they acquire new genes, for example, oncogenes. From my understanding of the PERV paper, because these loci can still be transcriptionally active, this form of recombination remains a distinct possibility, i.e. recombination with another replicating retrovirus, whether it's expressed by an ERV or an exogenous infection, 
could still occur, resulting in repair of the Paul defect and production of a replication-competent virus. For that matter, if the mutations in the PERVs themselves are not identical, it is also formally possible that two or more PERV loci could work in trans to generate virions with co-packaged RNAs that produce our, uh, reverse transcriptase-mediated recombinants. And cites the paper from the Goff Lab archives that demonstrates this phenomenon from way back in 1990. So that's why you have to get rid mm-hmm. of all the pervs. Yes. The they whole did, perv. They did that by cleaning yes. up 42nd Street in New York, by the way. <laughs> no, they just pushed them underground. They did? Uh, okay. There was a time when it was scary to walk along 42nd Street. Do you remember, Dixon? Absolutely. Now it's quite Disney-like, isn't it? It is. It's touristy. They, they did it on purpose, <laughs> and it worked. Kathy? Stephen writes, greetings to the Fellowship of the Virus. <laughs> Thank you all for a wonderful and entertaining podcast. You all help make my 90-minute commute easier to handle. The weather in Pittsburgh this morning is unseasonably warm, 72 Fahrenheit, 22 Celsius, with a bunch of high fair weather clouds and headed for 90 Fahrenheit, 32 oh, Celsius. Goodness. Hopefully autumn will return soon. <laughs> I enjoyed the lively discussion about plant-made polio vaccines in TWIV 459. I had an opportunity to tour the facility in North Carolina while I was a master's student in biomanufacturing at NC State University. The company is called Medicago, and they are based out of Quebec City. This company produces biotherapeutics and vaccines using the same tobacco strains as mentioned in the episode. Medicago built their North Carolina facility as part of DARPA's pandemic flu vaccine challenge. Make 10 million doses of a monovalent pandemic vaccine in less than three months. Using the plant method, they exceeded this goal by making more than the ten more than the required ten million doses. Since then, Medicago has been looking f- at other uses for their plant expression platform, including other vaccines, rotavirus, HPV, uh, which is human papillomavirus, Norwalk, and therapeutic proteins, antibodies against Ebola, biosimilars, biobetters. <laughs> and he also includes a pick of the week, which we've pasted below. Okay. Uh, have we? Uh, okay. I believe so. I don't know. Peace and long life, Stephen. Okay. I'll uh, paste he's, it. he's at the University of Pittsburgh. All right, Rich, you're next. Gary writes, hi, Twiff gang. I know that this is not the normal follow-up, but I was just wondering if any of you had heard from Tyler. Oh, my goodness. This goes way back. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm not sure if he uh, – uh, that's uh, Tyler Sharp, who's our – a uh, friend from CDC who lives in Puerto Rico um, and uh, helps run the dengue program there or runs the dengue program there. I'm not even sure if he was still on the island. I hope he was able to evacuate before the storm hit, and I hope that if he was not able to leave, someone has heard from him. Do you uh, know if he's still serving there? Do you know if the CDC moves people out in that type of situation? The storm was so very bad that I know that if he is still there, he has probably lost everything. Maybe you would be able to find out if he needs any kind of assistance. Let us uh uh, and let us, your audience, know so that maybe we can send assistance in some way. I just happened to be listening to the old show he was on a week or so ago and was not really thinking about hurricanes making the entire island nearly unlivable. And now they're saying that not only are they short on water and food, but they can't even get diesel for a few generators they have there. I know you don't want to talk about politics, but that imbecile in the White House has really let the entire company uh, country down and, in my mind, has already killed so many because of this crap that I want to scream. Anyway, please update us if you find any information. So I, uh, this letter was further up in the queue um, <laughs> a while ago, and so in previewing for the show, I used to uh, you know, update it um, uh, uh, occasionally. Yes, I've corresponded with uh, Tyler. Uh, He was out of the country uh, on assignment um, in American Samoa when the storm hit. uh, And he uh, did not go back until the uh, mid-October. And uh, as of uh, November 14th or somewhere around the mid-November, his... Uh, lights and water had just come back on. He lives in an apartment. The building was still standing, but he was out of power and water uh, for a couple of months. Um, I've not corresponded with him uh, recently. Uh, and that's but, right in San Juan. 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've not corresponded with him uh, recently, but I assume since it was several weeks ago, uh, it, the power went on, and then the next thing I knew, it went off again. Okay, but they were uh, they were on their way back, and he said things were improving slowly. Okay, really slowly. The CDC was up and running um, uh, uh, quite quickly because that's uh, that's a priority. That's um, kind of their but, thing. So he's okay. Uh, they have had a rough go, uh, and um, you know they're on their way back slow. And the the outlying areas, I think Kathy just posted this very helpful link. Um, right. So Puerto Rico customers tracked 1.5 million state outages, 519,000 last updated today at 8:14 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time. Thank you. Which was uh, just a few minutes ago. Right. Well, thanks for uh, the update, Rich. Appreciate it. Sure. All right. One more is from Michelle. Dear Twivers, I'm writing about the use and misuse of the term DNA that Vincent and Kathy railed against during the discussion on scientific publication readability 25th minute of Twiv 461. Hear, hear. <laughs> Last month, I was excited about attending a book launch and seminar titled Digital DNA, only to find that digital DNA had nothing to do with actual DNA <laughs> or genetic sequence data. It is apparently a term that has been co-opted to mean an organization's corporate identity yes. and is some sort of branding strategy from it's what crap. I can make out. It's crap. The misuse of the term DNA is getting ridiculous. No kidding. And the term digital. And the term ecology. <laughs> <laughs> this is my first Keep time going. writing. <laughs> this is my first time writing the Twiv, but I've been listening religiously since 2011 when I was working towards my honors degree on intra-host genetic variation of Ross River virus. Hmm. Unfortunately, a series of physical ailments took me out of the laboratory, but I love the research process and viruses so much that I am now working on viruses and international law. I'm hmm. specifically researching virus access and benefit sharing the legal term for a quid pro quo on genetic resources and how treating viruses as commodities is likely to impact scientific research. I'm from Brisbane, Australia, where it's currently 17 degrees Celsius, of course, and mm -hmm. raining, but I'm currently writing from Washington, D.C., where it is 21 degrees and sunny. I love the show. Keep up the great work. Kind regards, Michelle. I have to say that I do refer to my children as DNA because their names are Devin, Nadia, and Aiden. That's okay. I said to my wife, where's the that. DNA? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's do some picks. Who's going to go first? Who would like to go first? I can I'll go, go first. first. There you go, Kathy. <laughs> Kathy, go, Kathy, Kathy, go, ahead. go for it. Uh, I picked a link that I found a while back. It's called <laughs> Today in Science History. And I said it. Uh, in this link for the for Sunday, the day that this show will be released, but you can change it to look at lots of other days, and so it's kind of nice. It just shows you various people that were born, and if you scroll down far enough, uh, uh, people who died on that particular day, and then events in science that happened on that day. Uh, it does seem to be a bit X Y skewed, and <laughs> I don't know if that's just because. Science history has been documented in an XY skewed way, uh, but uh, there are some references to women if you keep looking hard enough. <laughs> yes, There's some great. Quotes I think here. that's a that's a systemic problem with uh, science history works of many types. But uh, yeah, you're right. right. There's a. I love this quiz. Uh, okay, let's take a yeah. quiz. We are here to sell. Who said we are here to celebrate the completion of the first survey of the entire human genome? Without a doubt. This is the most important, most wondrous map ever produced by humankind. Francis Collins? No, no, it's a president. Ronald Reagan, Bill oh, Clinton, president. or Barack president. Obama? President. Clinton. Uh, Clinton. Clinton, right. Clinton. Sure. Ah, it's cool. I love quiz questions. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Look at them all. Look at them all. Give, us another, give me another one. All right, here's one more. Who said <laughs> environmental extremists wouldn't let you build a house unless it looked like a bird's nest? Is another president? Ronald Reagan, Theodore Roosevelt, or John Weir? Muir. It's got uh, John Muir. Muir. It's got to be Ronald Muir. Reagan. Muir. Let's see. Muir. Let's no, see. No, I'm, no. I'm going to check it the answer. Reagan. It's Ronald Reagan. Reagan. Yeah. Mm. A nice site. That's cool. I like that. And they have these quotes down on the front page, too. This is very nice. I like this. This is very cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Who wants to go next? I'll go next. 
It's the first time uh, in history I've this actually is, asked. This is, You've actually given people is. a choice. People this are is. dumbfounded. They don't know what to do. Stunned. I'm sorry, <laughs> no, I was ready. <laughs> <laughs> this is. Uh, this was pointed out to me by my wife. This is almost clickbait, but it was just too amusing to pass <laughs> up. Okay, so uh, uh, SpaceX, um, uh, run by Elon Musk, is about to test a new prototype mega rocket right. that's basically three of their Falcon nines strapped together that has a uh, a force almost equivalent to the Saturn V, but uh, not quite. And it's going to throw things far into space. He fully expects it to blow up. Um, yes, he said <laughs> but, that too. He did so say for that. the yeah. So for the test uh, launch, he has said that he is going to put uh, a, a Tesla, a red Tesla ro- Roadster, into orbit. His his <laughs> red Tesla Roadster specifically. His, Red Tesla Roadster. It's not entirely clear that this is not a joke. (laughs) Right. Exactly. Because he's, this came out on Twitter and then he said, no, no, no. And then it was back and blah, blah, blah. But even if it is a joke, it's great. It's a pretty Uh good joke. Yes. So would the car just be on its own uh, circling around the earth? That's the idea. He says, no, listen to this. (laughs) Uh, The (laughs) plan, if all goes as planned, the Roadster will wind up in a long elliptical orbit around the sun, stretching as far out uh, as the orbit of Mars. Good. Okay. Good. He says, I love the thought of a car drifting apparently endlessly through space and perhaps being discovered by an alien race millions of years in the future. So which car do you think he really should have put in orbit? A Volkswagen Beetle. No, a Saturn. Oh. <laughs> Anyway, you it's know, got nice pictures. I'm it's got glad nice pictures of the rock. I'm glad he's not putting it around Earth because there's enough junk up there already. There's tons yes. of junk up there. And a car. And, uh, Can you make a joke out of that, Alan? <laughs> a car. <Yes. in> <laughs> By the way, uh, uh, two of these, uh, two of the rockets that are being used in this triple rocket thing uh, are um, have already been used because he's into this reusable. Oh, thing. sure. And they are going to try and land all three of these things. Yes. Uh, as they come back down. Nope. So that'll be interesting. He just recently uh, supplied the International Space Station with a reusable rocket that uh, has already gone up once. So this guy is amazing. He's truly yeah. amazing. I love him. It, he's, he's interesting. I love him. So I, I hope he actually does this. <laughs> well, yeah, he's kind of got mixed emotions about this one. <laughs> you know, he hopes the rocket blows up and then he can declare the cars and attacks. As a total loss, right? <laughs> exactly. More, more importantly, can I mean, the, the car the was absolutely total totaled. <laughs> In fact, we can't find it. <laughs> what is this? Uh, the star.com. Does anyone know what it is? Yeah. No. Uh, this story is, has made the rounds. This is, I looked at several different sites. This is, uh, you know, one of the Very ones funny. that I found. Well, that it must be good because it. here's a headline at the bottom. Donald Trump has spent a year lying shamelessly. It hasn't worked. The star has been keeping track. <laughs> okay. Right. <laughs> it's my kind of site. That's right. Um, so, by the way, uh, what's his face? Who just went out of Congress. Um, Franken, Al Franken, mm-hmm. left with a big list of, of lies that uh, he <laughs> kept track of while he was still in the good graces of the Senate. The star.com seems to be connected to the Toronto star. Ah, uh, yes. Okay. So I have a pick that relates to the new year and mm-hmm. uh, you get to the end of the year and you type out the 10 best or the five best or the 18 best places to go on vacation or the, the newest flavors of ice cream came out of um, Baskin Robbins or something. Anyway, these are the top 10 picks from uh, uh, MIT for the, um, the, the best 10 technological breakthroughs of 2017, and mm. I thought they were kind of interesting. They had some biological ones and some others that were not biological. The one I found most intriguing was the uh, solar um, panel disc material, which was fashioned into a uh, an orb of some sort, which heated up to a very high temperature of around 1,000 degrees and then generated light from the heat and then could store light and in the form of heat – it was a very complicated invention, but it meant that you could use solar panels as a heat storage device in addition to generating light with enough heat that came out of it. And so if you look at this um, blurb that came out associated with that particular invention, it's uh, got a potential 
for storing sunlight as heat, which could then be turned into electricity during the evening and night so that you didn't need sunlight and you could still take advantage of it, which is what they intend this for. You know, Dixon, if you Google top 10 best virology stories, you'll get all of our past twibs. Hot darn. Uh, top 10 stuff that we do at well, the end of the year. Mm. Well, we're good. We know this. No, no. It's, it's a Google thing. Who else is going to do the top 10 <laughs> virology stories? That's right. Stories? Top, top 10 virology <laughs> stories. It sounds like a of, David Letterman thing. We should probably have something like that, too, but we don't. We kind of own that market, I think. Yeah, that's right. So that means we should do one this year, right? Probably. We'll do yeah. one the, the first week of uh, 2018. <laughs> um, Alan, what right. do you have Yeah, for I'll, us? I'll go ahead. Um <laughs> <laughs> so I have, I guess you could take this as a Christmas theme thing. This is a data visualization. Um, and everybody goes out and does their Christmas shopping and puts it on the credit card. And this is a map of debt in America. So it's a, the data it's, themselves are kind of a, a downer, but the visualization <laughs> I think is really well done. And mm-hmm. this organization, uh, the urban Institute does a lot of this sort of thing. Um, so a couple of things I thought were really cool about it. I mean, first there's just the overview. You get this graphic map of the United States mapping household debt levels as measured by, um, proportion of people in each County who have debt that is in collection. And they explain this term. Um, and they also break it down by the overall population, uh, white and non-white populations, which of course give you disparities of various sorts. Um, and the, the other thing, so I love maps and I love data visualizations and I just think this is a really cool approach and you can, you can drill down to the state level, you know, click on a state and then you can go to the county level and see the statistics for that county. The other cool thing is if you, um, uh, like to do data analysis yourself, you can click on a link to download their full data set. Mm-hmm. Right. Neat. Wow. It's Absolutely. just right yeah. there. So you can write your own, you know, R scripts yeah, or yeah, something yeah. to analyze and parse this any which way you like. And they collected it and now they're, they're turning it over and anybody can go and look at it. Dixon, get on it. So farmer, I will. So farmers yeah. are always in debt and that really comes out in this map. That's quite yes. interesting. We're, Far- we're, and, and rural poverty really. Yeah, yeah. 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 And also pockets of urban poverty. Yes. Um, but, you know, the you North- can also see where the farmers are doing quite well and not, are not in yes. debt, and they're selling high produce, uh, high price. So produce. the Northwest is doing pretty well. Yes, Northeast the, is not bad. The Midwest up top there, the mm-hmm. Southern Minnesota, coastal yeah. states are not so great. Min- and you could you mm-hmm. could overlay a political map on this and see some interesting correlations. I'm sure. Yeah, it's hard oh, to yeah. believe that Louisiana has more debt than Mississippi, but that's the way it is. That is the way it is. Yeah. <laughs> what I, what I really like. Alan, I agree with you about the map is that when you click on each individual county, it gives you the name of the county. So you don't have to guess, (laughs) you know, is is this the one I want? Sure. (laughs) Right. Because in Michigan, they're all kind of all rectangular. Look at at the debt. I know where Washington I is. Look at the debt through Central Valley in California because of the drought that hit. I mean, that's debt really, believe me, and and nothing happened. That was six years of debt, six years of drought rather. Hmm. And, and Alaska, Alaska's got issues, huh? Incredible. Yeah, because you know what? The uh, salmon runs and all kinds of other things are not doing as well as they used to well, be. Well, and if you look at the counties in Alaska that have issues, they are the remote yeah, counties that's right. where you're going to have a large indigenous population. Exactly. That is largely broke. Um, that's it. And in fact, the statistics, again, cool data visualization, um, you can look at uh, uh, white versus non-white breakdowns and they have incomplete data, but um, but you see that this is pretty much, you know, yeah. that that may explain most of that debt. Mm, it's Indeed. cool. Very cool. But mostly it's not the urban centers. It's really yeah. interesting. It's the rural areas are hardest hit. Rich, what's the name of your county? Uh, it's Travis. I was looking at Travis? that. Is that the gray square yeah. where it's not available or? <laughs> no, uh, I got a, uh, here it is. Travis County, uh, all 37% white, 21% non-white, 54%. Kathy, how so, about your? It's a, it's a sort of a medium blue. Okay. It's not Austin County. Okay. No, okay. no, Travis County. Got it. Oh, I see. Yeah. George is a little like that. The name of the county is not where the city with not the same name where the is. City is. Right. <laughs> yeah. Te- Texas in general, however, is not in great shape. That's right. not mm-hmm. news. 
No, well, that's um, they've it's, had huge uh, it's it's interesting also. to see that that the trend here. I mean, just sort of sort of uh, fuzz out and look at the whole map. Uh, the north does better than the south. Yep, it's true. Yeah, so th- this <laughs> this is what I did when I saw this. I, mean, I just kept drilling down. Oh, look at that! Oh, that's interesting. Wow! Oh, this is interesting. Yeah. 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 <laughs> wow. It's gonna get worse. It's gonna get worse. Yep. And better, depending on who you are. <laughs> well, for the, the percentage for whom it'll get better will not affect the statistics on this map. No. It'll be interesting to see the migration of people away from states that are hit hardest by this new tax law changes. Because, or the deaths. And Yeah, exactly. They're going to – did anyone hear whether the, uh, uh, the childhood medical insurance uh, plan was saved or not? Don't know. I don't know. I, don't know I what think that's part of the – isn't that part of the – Budget? It's yes, budget. budget. It is. It is. It is. Yeah, it is. The, but they were supposed to vote on that today. Well, they right? extended it till mid January. Yeah. Okay, and so right. was that the can down the road? Then, so we don't know. January, we don't know. Geez. Yeah, they didn't have time to uh, deal with it properly. I mean, I heard a heart wrenching NPR blurb from, um, I believe it was Alabama. Uh, the the woman in charge of that program had eighty four thousand children underneath her with regards to this insurance program. She mm-hmm. said, "We'll just." We're going to have to just tell those mothers and fathers that we don't have any money. Yeah. It's going to stop. And those are all going to be disenfranchised in another two months. Mm. How can you so, do that? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't get it either. I mean, because they're going to show up at hospitals and then they're going to tr- get charged anyway. And someone else is going to yep. pay for that. Yep. And the rates of their insurances are going to go way up. Yep. What's the f- – I don't get it either. <clears throat> So anyway, Vincent, you had a pick? Uh, so wait, 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 wait. Yeah, uh, one more thing. So right, Alan, we're still this, going through on, this on map. <laughs> on this map, right? Uh, the, map. the color code on the map, they talk about percent. That is percent of the population or households that, or something that have yeah, debt percent, under collection. Yes, I think that's percent of the population that has debt under collection. So uh, to Dixon's point about farms, farmers will often have a lot of debt, but it's not going to be in collection necessarily right. unless yeah, that's they're true. <laughs> they're overdue on payments. So this is this is a measure of how much debt trouble people are in. Yeah. I've heard a statistic on this one too and that a lot of people newly graduated uh, people from college if you added all their debt up it would be somewhere near a trillion dollars. Yeah. It's an incredible debt. So black hmm. is 70%. Yeah. And there's a lot of black here. This that's is right. not yeah. good. That's right. Nope. That's right. No. And it's through the poverty belts, and uh, it's yes. really true. It's really absolutely true. And when you have an entire county that's like that, and everybody's got debt in collection, that right. is a place that is in in an economic death spiral. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, all right. I've so got that's just why you're on that cheery note. That's why Trump wants to bring back season. coal. <laughs> I, I think I think Vincent has something. I have a pick, but it's not too cheerful. No, it's, my pick is a book by Tom Nichols called "The Death of Expertise." <laughs> Yeah. Not a, a come on. I'm depressed enough as it is. I'm sorry. What are you doing to sorry, us? This is important. This is important because you know we're amongst people who are interested in expertise and have some, and yet there's a problem. So this was actually an essay picked by Sean in Twiv four two three not too long ago, and now it is a book. And there is a nice review uh, in the Times, which I'll link to. It's called "The Death of Expertise: Explores How Ignorance Became a Virtue." I think that says it all, right? And right. it's mainly, you know, he they provide examples of what all the screwy things, Trump's disregard for policy expertise and knowledge, his own just as his own election victory underscores many voters scorn for experience. It's part of a larger wave of anti rationalism that has been accelerating for years. And so this book uh, explores it. It is basically a overview of how we got to this place. And it has links to other books that are written on this issue as well, like uh, Al Gore's The Assault on Reason, Susan J- Jacoby's The Age of American Unreason, and so forth. So it's very frustrating because, you know, as scientists, we're brought up to uh, appreciate expertise and knowledge and understanding. And, you know, we're in a culture that doesn't value it uh, any longer and in fact, it's scorned in some circles, which I find just impossible. You may not like education and knowledge, but don't make fun of it, because without it, we would be in even bigger trouble. But anyway, the book I find engaging because it really uh, tells you how we got here, and um, it's pretty depressing, but 
we have to know this. We have to know what's going on, I think. And if you go to the <clears throat> Amazon page, it is it is a work of art. If you look at the book cover, the book cover is, you know, the death of expertise, the campaign against established knowledge and why it matters, Tom Nichols. And then the, the cover design has these posted things that look like they would be um, in, a, in an Internet forum uh, that's a wiki scholar saying a book. I can find all the info I need online for free. Thank yep. you very yep. much. Yep. This, right. this kind of thing. So the book cover design is cool. But what's even better is you scroll down to the reviews and they're mostly five star reviews. People, you know, saying, yeah, this is this is a, an excellent book. The the number number one most recent review, though, uh, Chrissy Gutierrez, an elitist telling you that you should listen to elitists. One star review. <laughs> so, so she said, well, I Thus, didn't have, wait. proving the point. She should have right. said, well, I actually didn't read the book, but <laughs> yeah, <probably laughs> I objected not. to the title. <laughs> probably not. No, Alan, trust me on this one. Yeah. Uh, the Amazon has a two review tier system. One is that uh, people can criticize a book any way they want. And the other one is these are the critics of the people yeah. who actually read the book. And in fact, that that review does what? not say verified purchase. Actually, so you, read the book. How could you criticize the book without reading the book? Let me let me, let me relate a, an experience I had recently. I was listening to a tech podcast, which I listened to for a while. I thought the two hosts were intelligent people. And a couple of weeks ago, one of them started talking about the mismatch of the H three N two component of the flu vaccine. Of course, they didn't say that. They said, "Oh, there's a the, the vaccine this year is not good." And one of the hosts said, well, I never get flu vaccine. And the guy said, well, I don't know if we should get this if it's mismatched, you know. So I wrote in, I tweeted, and I said, for their information, you know, flu vaccine is volunteer. But you should make a decision based on in intelligent information, right? So I wrote, you know, there are more than one component to the vaccine. And the other components are not mismatched, so they can still protect you against infection. And so to my surprise, I'm, I'm driving up uh, – to Maris to pick up my son a couple of uh, weeks ago and I hear them and I knew it's me because the guy goes oh we have an email here from Vincent uh, uh, <laughs> and I said that's got to be me and Vincent of course Brackenilla. they spent five minutes making fun of my name yeah right and then they read my tweet and the one guy said this guy works for industry he just wants us to buy his vaccine oh, and that was it that was it get out can you imagine I was so disappointed. I was just trying to inform them, but here it is, expertise. I don't want it. Yep. Since ah. I don't work for <laughs> industry, but my wife does. <laughs> well, you know, it's not hard to find out who I am, right? <laughs> it's not hard. No, it's not hard. But it's even uh, easier to cast dispersions without bothering to find out. You got it. You're absolutely right. Fake news is easy to generate. Well, one of them said, who's this guy? And the other one said, oh, let's see. Oh, he is a virologist and he has microbe.tv. And that's all they said, you know. So, but they still right. concluded that I work for industry. I tell you, I was very disappointed because I was just trying to give people information. I'm not telling them to get the vaccine. I'm just saying, but. Ooh, write them back again. I said, yeah. <laughs> I decided not to because what am I going to do? Get embroiled in an argument? No. Uh, I don't want to do it. Anyway. So this, uh, this, uh, I'm uh, entertained <clears throat> by this about the author, Tim Nichols. Mm -hmm. He's a professor of national security affairs at the U.S. Naval War College, adjunct professor at Harvard Extension School, former aide in the U.S. Senate. So he ought to know what he's talking about. He's also the author of several works on foreign policy and international security affairs, and it names those. And then it says he is also a five-time undefeated Jeopardy champion. champion. <laughs> Mm. Really? And as one of the all-time top players of the game, he was invited back to play in 2000, the 2005 Ultimate Tournament of Champions. Nice. Wow. <laughs> wow. All right, we have some listener picks. This is from first one from Stephen, who says, I'm including a pick of the week. I was browsing the literature when one of my lab mates handed me a copy of this paper. He links to it. He says, I believe that this is one of the most concise papers I have ever read and... Like the reviewers, I find no flaws in the experimental design or results. Enjoy. I think this has been a previous pick, but it is excellent. It is yeah. <laughs> and it's open access. Yes. So I highly recommend Yes, you should check it out. Um, then we have Johnny, our friend in Cambridge. Merry Holidays. There were other parodies of Christmas and holiday songs, but I feared some might think them offensive. And Johnny provides some links to YouTube videos of parodies. Of Christmas and holiday songs. My and the first one of these, by the way, um, is from Acapella Science, which I think has been a, mm -hmm. a pick. And this particular mm -hmm. one is really, really good. 
That's brilliant. It is, it is a brilliant. tour de force of, of what this guy is capable of in his vocal range and his it. video processing and in his creativity. It's just absolutely amazing. Have you looked at this, Kathy? No, I haven't. I didn't get it. The oh, Anamalia, it yeah, the Anamalia Anamalia chorus. chorus. Yeah. Oh, I may have seen that then. I don't know okay. if, if it's more than a year old. It is. Uh, yeah. Anamalia. Yeah. And Amelia, and Amelia. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my best to you in the star scientists who generously and faithfully instruct, inform, and contribute to the greater good with each episode of this weekend series of podcasts. Strength to all for the new year, our shared birth date and beyond. <laughs> and then shared we, birth date. Wait a minute. I think she she must share Vincent's birthday. I think so. It's coming up. I think so it is okay. coming up. And then we have one from Tom who writes, Dear Vincent and crew, the Central Texas noon weather. Tom is from Austin, by the way. Mm Yeah. Headline for today, December 7th reads, Few flurries today, then coldest night in 11 months. Currently it's 45F, 7.2C, 68% humidity, 2.35F, 1.66C. The drizzle is letting up, and we expect our first freeze of the season tonight. I've got a listener pick, or maybe it's a pick of a listener. The recently released book Soonish has been in the news lately. Those who read the SMBC webcomic are probably familiar with husband and wife authors Zach and Kelly Wienersmith. Zach is a full-time cartoonist. Kelly is a parasitology researcher at Rice University. Think Houston. Her most recent paper focused on how parasites control host behavior. One of Zach's recent SMBC comics had this dialogue. Him, do you think viruses are truly alive? Her, nah, they're just barely getting by. (laughs) The comic's (laughs) hidden text comment was, if 8% of our DNA comes from viruses, are we technically undead? (laughs) I wrote to Zach and asked him if, one, Kelly listened to Vincent's podcast, and two, if this comic was inspired by the Twiv crew kicking this question around. He responded that, yes, Kelly did listen to the podcast, but no, Twiv didn't trigger this particular comic. By the way, the November 29th Freakonomics podcast made references to Soonish, and you can hear Kelly responding to their questions. Maybe you can get her on TWIP. Does that count as a pick of SMBC or of Kelly Wienersmith? (laughs) I don't know. Whatever you want. I know that XKCD has been a pick before, but I want to highlight three recent Twix-related entries. Uh, One ranked scientific fields along a line that represented how worried you should be if you see local reporters interviewing scientists about a breaking news story. Yeah, this is very good. Virologist came in third, most worrying, behind volcanologist and astronomer who studies the sun. <laughs> mm-hmm. Very good. Another one had XY axes defining quadrants. The horizontal low to high axis represented risk of the thing you're studying breaking free from your facility and threatening the local population. <laughs> And the vertical low to high axis represented risk of your research being used by a supervillain for war- world domination. Genetic engineering and microbiology were the most extreme in the high, high quadrant. Yeah. And the third uh, comic shows a thermometer above the following caption. Since the Celsius versus Fahrenheit debate has proven surprisingly hard to resolve, as a compromise, I've started using Celsius <laughs> as the average of the two. <laughs> Conversion formulas appear in the picture. <laughs> Tom and Austin, P.S. A more recent XKCD noted that the moon's craters and plains are the only structures on the surface of a celestial body that can be seen with the naked eye from the Great Wall of China. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Lovely. All oh, right. These are all very good. Thank you very much, Tom. Uh, thanks, uh-huh. everyone. You can find Twiv at microbe.tv and Apple Podcasts. And, of course, on your favorite podcatcher, just find Twiv and subscribe. And send your questions and comments to twiv at microbe.tv and consider supporting us. In the last few weeks, we have a bunch of people who have supported us. That's great. Thank you so much. Keep it going. Thank you. Microbe.tv slash contribute. Dixon de Pommier is at thelivingriver.org and parasiteswithoutborders.com, just to name a few of his websites. Thank you, Dixon. <laughs> You're welcome, Vincent. Happy, happy New Year. Not yet. Next week you can say Happy oh. New Year because we have another show. Merry Christmas then. <laughs> <laughs> Kathy Spindler is at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Thank you, Kathy. She's gone. Thank you, Kathy. <laughs> Whoa. Uh-oh. Did you mute yourself? 
I did mute myself. Oops. I've been sneezing uh. a little bit. Sorry. Oh. Thanks. This is a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> Rich Condit, emeritus professor at the University of Florida in Gainesville, currently residing in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough. Always a good time. Alan Dove is at turbidplaque.com. He's on Twitter as Alan Dove. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. And I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I want to thank the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV and the intro music from Ronald Jenkins at ronaldjenkins.com. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week with another TWIV is viral. <laughs>